Hi, my name is Ben Clifford. I'm going to be talking about gradual typing in Python, some of the nice things, some of the bad and the, and the ugly things. So this is starting as an experience report on my work on the parcel project, which is a parallel scripting library uh, for running uh, things on supercomputers. And it started as, as a prototype at the University of Chicago in around 2016, and now it's up to production version 1.2 release. So this code is mostly in Python, uh, but I'm a Haskell enthusiast. Uh, I've used Haskell for a lot of a lot of my work, not just for fun. And so, as you can imagine, when I started uh, working on an existing Python prototype code base. I was fairly horrified by some of the bugs that, that we encountered. So I saw that Python was getting some type annotation uh, features at the time. And I thought, well, let's have a little explore of these, how they how do they work? And maybe if, if uh, they're any good, I can use them to improve the quality of the code. So um, because I'm a Haskeller, um, you can see that I'm fairly convinced that, that type annotations would help with that. So I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to, um, to the basics of, of, of the type system in Python. And then after that, I'm gonna dive into just a few topics where it starts getting a little bit more complicated uh, based on my experience of adding type annotations to the parcel project. So in normal, normal Python, traditional Python, the, the way the type system works is that values have types and variables do not. So if you look at this code example here, I assign the number three into the variable X, and I can say, what is the type of the value stored in X? And I get an int. I can assign um, a new value to that X, the empty dictionary, and I can say, what is the type of the value stored in X? And I get told it's a dict. So there's no type of X. There's only the type of the values that are stored in X, which can change over time. That's how Python is. If you're not using any of this, this typing stuff that I'm gonna talk about, but um, what we, we can do is put on type annotations like this. So here are two implementations of the same function a square function, which will return the square of its parameter. The top copy is the, the, the untyped Python version, uh, just takes a parameter y and returns y times y. The bottom version is the same thing. And I've just added in three type annotations that say y, the parameter is a float. The function is gonna return a float and the variable x is um, always going to contain a float. So I can use that if I try and invoke it and pass in um, the empty list, for example, if I try and take the square of the empty list, well, it doesn't actually have any effect. I, I do get a, a, an exception because uh, Python, regular Python will um, detect the, this type incompatibility, but, it, but it's returning the exception at the point where I'm trying to say y times y, line two in this example. Okay, it hasn't actually used those type annotations for anything at all. They might as well not be there. And that's because Python will let you put annotations in, but it won't use them by default for anything at all. So there's a few different ways that we can use them. I'll talk about the two ways that, that I've been using them in the parcel project. The first one is runtime checking. So you add this little uh, decorator on the top at typeguard.typechecked, and that says modify the implementation of Square so that it checks its parameters when it's when when someone invokes me. So now, if I call Square of uh, the empty list, I get a much nicer looking um, error. It's told me that the argument y is, is wrong, and it has to be a float or an int. Python is a little bit vague about, about numbers. 
uh, there, which is why why they why it lets either be passed in. Tells me that I passed the list in instead. So this is still a runtime error, uh, but it's happened at the point that the function was invoked, which is way better than deep in the body of a of a, a big function, and it's I'm much clearer about what's gone wrong. So when I was trying to sell type checking to other people on the project, uh, this, this I found is a pretty easy sell because it's very easy to conceptualize that um, what's being done here is the same as sticking some if statements at the top of the function to perform type checks. Um, that there's, there's no weird type inference or anything like that happening. It's just a, an if statement is magically being inserted. The other kind of checking you can do is static checking. So for this, I use a tool called MyPy, and this will um, perform static checking. So it doesn't run your code. It just looks for typing compatibilities. And again, if we say this was in source.py and we ran um, MyPy on source.py, it would give us a slightly different phrasing of basically the same error, the first argument, um, has incompatible type a list and we were expecting a float so this um, in parcel we run for example as part of our ci pipeline so it's um, slightly unusual compared to if you if you're used to say haskell or even c or rust where you expect type checking to happen as part of a compilation process that's not what's happening here this this you run my pie whenever you want and it might be in your commit hooks. It might be in um, whenever you're whenever you're running the code. We've chosen to run it as part of our CI process, so that you can't merge a PR unless um, unless the type checking passes. So a few other simple things to do with Python's type system. Uh, there's a type hierarchy, so everything is an object. Um, float is a subclass of or subtype of object. So F wants an object, I'm passing in a float. Well, anywhere that I need an object, I can pass in a float. So that type checks okay. I don't think there's anything crazy there. Uh, the, the, one of the really interesting features is gradual typing. And we'll see this through the rest of the talk. And the way that this is implemented is there's a, a special type called any, and any will type check against any type. So here there's a function that takes a float. I've made a variable call, called y, which is of type any, and that means I can assign a list into y because list will match against any. Then I'm going to invoke the function which wants a float and pass in a value uh, passing the value y, which is an any, and any matches against the float as well. So this will type check. And then when you run it at runtime, you'll get the standard Python dynamic runtime error. Okay, so this is um, a way of where you can say, well, actually, this is too complicated to type check, or I haven't got round to figuring out the types for this yet. In um, in the in the uh, parcel code base because it was written uh, when it was prototyped, there was no type checking in place. So there, there are various um, behaviors, which I'll talk a little bit about later that are quite hard to, to write type annotations for. And so you can kind of uh, work around it by saying, well, a type isn't any type. Now, this is not the same as an object, right? An object, every object is, Every, everything is an object. So if I want, if I have a function which takes an object, um, I could pass in a, a list, for example, but I wouldn't then be able to do uh, list specific activities. So for example, if I was passing in an object to F here, I wouldn't be able to use plus on it because you can't add objects. So, an example of this that I've seen in, in our code base looks like this. I've got a variable A that we define to be some kind of planet object. And then we pick a country on the planet and the city on the planet and the coordinates of the city. 
Um, so the type of A might change in this code. The value stored in A might have four different types in this code fragment. Um, so if I was writing this from scratch to be typed, I wouldn't reuse the variable A. I would, I would um, use different variables or just structure the code differently. But if I just wanted to put a quick type annotation in, then here would be a place where I would put any. A few other things, there are union types. Um, so this function f takes either a float or a string. The important difference from a, a lot of languages is this is not a tagged union. It's x is just a float or just a string. There's no labeling of am I choosing left or right or anything like that. Um, so when I've been, once, once I'm inside the body of the function, I can refine that type down a little bit by asking, um, is X an instance of float? And tools such as MyPy will recognize this idiom of asking is instance X float? Um, so that when they type check the body of this, the, the X times two, they will say, yeah, X is a float. It's not, a, uh, it's not either a float or a string. So you end up with floats being effectively a subtype of the union of float and string. And string is also a subtype of uh, the union of float and string. There's a particular pattern in Python where um, often if you have a function that fails, but you don't want to raise an exception, then you will return the value none. So a lot, of the, a lot of the time you would write that this function returns um, either the type I'm, I want, like a file descriptor or whatever, um, or I'm going to return none. And there's a shorthand for that, which is optional. So I can say optional X, that's the same as a union of X or none. And there are generics. Uh, this square bracket syntax is, is just generic syntax. Um, so if I say list on its own, what I really mean is a list where the elements are of any type. So it can be a, a um, heterogeneous list, or I can say a list of strings and that forces um, X to only have strings in that list. I don't think there's anything particularly um, unusual there, except that it's common to use uh, things like a list without a parameter to, to imply the, the gradual typed form list any. So to summarize that brief introduction, uh, we've got type annotations, but the enforcement of those annotations is pluggable. Uh, the, two, the two tools that I use are TypeGuard for runtime enforcement and MyPy for static uh, CI time enforcement of, of those same annotations. We've got generics and unions, nothing special there, I think, and uh, gradual typing, which is this any type, distinct from the object type. So I've talked about some of the, the simple things for Python typing, and I hope that that's convinced you that you would like to use it. I'm going to go through some topics that are more complicated. So the first one is duck typing. So this is a, a, a form of um, typing in dynamic languages where you, you say, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. The example that I use here um, is I've defined a function print len, which calls length on its argument x. Um, and you can call length on various types in Python. So you can, and you can call it on an empty list, an empty dictionary, or a dictionary with stuff in it, or a string. Um, and you can't call it on a float, for example. And you'll, you'll get either it will work for the first three types or you'll get a runtime type error. So these types, list, dick, and string, don't have a common supertype. They don't have anything like a type class instance either that says len is available. So um, it's, it's hard from what we've seen already to, to imagine what I would put as a type annotation for X that would successfully describe list, dick, and string and would not capture floats, for example. So there's a thing called protocols, which is a little bit like type classes in Haskell. And here's an example for declaring 
uh, how length works. So the duck typing in Python for a length, it, for length is um, if you want your object to be able to tell you its length, then you implement uh, a method underscore underscore len underscore underscore, which returns the length. And this protocol here describes, um, says there's a protocol called sized and it has that method. So that looks quite like a, a type class definition in Haskell, for example. Um, and it works. You, you can see that we get the values. Uh, we can use sized as a type annotation. If I ask if a dictionary is sized, I get told true. If I try and um, apply print len to a number, I, I get told, no, it's an int. I want it as sized. One thing that's interesting here is there is nothing, there's no declaration that says, oh, a list is sized or a string is sized. That's detected automatically because this is a protocol um, to, to by saying if my object has this underscore underscore len method, then it's an instance of size. So for example, I can define a class, define my own length method. Now I have, if I make an instance of my new class A and ask for its length, I'll get told 128 and I'll get, um, I'll be able to see that sized, that, that my object A is an instance of sized. Um, and this will be checked statically as well. So it's like I can declare a, a new super type for classes and the way that, that um, classes become subclasses of this super type is by just implementing the methods that I've described. So Python has various other other methods, um, lot, lots of lots of built in stuff such as string representation and whatever is done using methods like this. OK, this is a, a bit of a an awkward to type situation. If I want, when I define a function, I can say, instead of naming the arguments, binding them to variables, I can say, just give me a list of all of the arguments um, and give me bind, bind all of the arguments um, into a list and all of the keyword arguments into um, a dictionary. So this example prints out how many arguments you are. So I can call F with no parameters, I can pass in three, parameters I can I can pass in a keyword argument it's awkward this is sort of getting into the space of the printf printf typing printf kind of world of how do I know how can I describe what args um what what type args can be because it could be like my function could be using them for anything and this is one of the hardest problems I've had in practice in parcel in there's a few places we use this and it's really hard to specify what args is beyond a list of arbitrary stuff. And I don't really have any good, good stuff to say about this, but I just want to point out that, that this exists as a, a feature or a problem. Another interesting thing in Python is uh, decorators. So we saw earlier, I put in this app type guard type checked in front of a function. Uh, there's, there's lots of other stuff lets you, lets you um, decorate functions. So for example, parcel, there's a bash app decorator, which says run this function remotely. Um, there's a, a web application server called Flask, which says when someone hits the URL slash post slash seven invoke, this show post method and pass in the, the number as a parameter. And that's defined by putting on a decorator. So it gives you very interesting um, abilities to, to write stuff mostly in Python with your own little domain specific language around it. But it can be quite hard to, to type check this. Uh, what this desugars to in approximately is if I apply my decorator to a function f like this. First, we define the function, and maybe it's a lambda expression, or maybe we, we're going to pretend it has a name. And then we pass that function to my decorator. 
And then whatever comes back from that function, that's what we bind to the original function name. So my decorator gets to do anything it wants. It can completely ignore the function definition if it wants to. It gets to do anything it wants. So it's quite hard to, to type that. If I, if I say, well, here's a function that takes an int and returns an int, what's the type of my decorator going to be? It's a going to take a function of some kind, but um, the parameters could be arbitrary. And I'm going to return a function of some kind. And that function could look quite different from the original function that I passed in. So in a very simple case, I can say, well, I'm going to use type variables um, and say, well, whatever, whatever signature my function has that's being decorated, the, the decorated function is going to have exactly the same signature. And um, that's usable when you're, you're making a decorator which doesn't change the, the type parameters. But in parcel, for example, that's a problem. When you decorate a function like this using parcel, um, it takes an int, returns a string, but um, what I want the decorated function to have is the type int to a future of a string. Uh, this is part of the concurrency library that we use. So it's not expressive enough. The type system is not expressive enough, at least in Python, 3.9 or before to say, yeah, I, I want to rewrite the return value of uh, the function I've been passed to, to put, put this future wrapper around, around it. So one of the things I've experimented with is you can put plugins in MyPy to perform your own custom type checking. Um, and so I could, I experimented with putting in some code to, that understands how parcels decorators work so that it could elaborate this a little bit better but that felt quite clunky and, and unmaintainable um, so i haven't really proceeded with it so the next weirdness is covariance and contravariance now this exists i've encountered it in other languages um, but for some reason i've encountered it more in the in our parcel code base um, than I have in other, other languages. So what's happening here? What, what do I mean by co and contravariance? Say I have a class of animals and then I have a subclass of animals called dog. So a dog is a type of animal and an animal is a type of object. If I have a, a list of animals, it's the empty list and I can make a function called add dog, which takes a list of dogs and it's going to make a new dog and append it into the list. Is it valid to pass in a list of animals into this function? And in this case, yes, it is. Um, it's absolutely fine. What's going to happen is that animals is going to have a dog added to it. And um, that's okay because a dog is an, is a, is a, is a kind of animal, so the list will still be comprised entirely of animals. But here's a, a different example. Um, similar setup, I have a, an animals list and it's got cats and dogs in it and a cow as well. And I've made a function count dogs, which takes a list of dogs and prints how many dogs there are. Is it valid to pass in animals to this function, which um, the type signatures are basically the same? as before. It's not valid. This is going to say there are four dogs because in this case, I can't uh, treat a list of dogs as a subtype of a list of animals. Okay, so it's not always safe to move between, um, although animals and dogs are, are related by this containment hierarchy, it's not always safe to um, lift that into generics containing containing those, this again. So covariance, for example, um, if a dog is a, if dog is a subtype of animal, that means that a read-only sequence of dogs is a subtype of a read-only sequence of animals. 
So sequence is a read only um, list or tuple or whatever. Okay, so um, wherever, if wherever um, I need an animal, you can pass in a dog, then wherever I need a sequence of animals, I can pass in a sequence of dogs. Okay, that works because sequence is read only. It can't be modified, um, which we which happened earlier. Contravariance is the other way around. That says if a dog is a subtype of animal, that means if any time I ask for an animal, I can substitute a dog. The relationship is the other way around. So, for example, callables, which are functions, a function which takes a dog and returns a string. If I need to, if I need a function which takes a dog and returns a string, I can instead use a function which takes any animal and returns a string. So the arrow changes direction here of the, the containment. Dog is a subtype of animal, but functions of animals are a subtype of functions of dogs. Um, and so we have a read-only sequence is like a list. Function arguments are contravariant and otherwise you, you have to treat something like a list. You have to treat it as invariant. So you can't ever um, safely substitute um, a list of type X when, when, you're, when, when you need a list of type Y, even if there's a subtype relationship between X and Y. And most of the practical problems retrofitting this into the partial code base are absolutely based around the use of list. And generally it's been fine to replace it with sequence which is a, a read-only view of a list effectively. Um, I think there's, there were a few bugs that, that were discovered by having to, to fix this and get this to type check. So now I'm going to talk about some of the development considerations when developing the, the parcel library. Um, this, this work started, as I said, as an exploration for myself, but now we want some of this to go into the parcel production code base. Uh, now that now that we've seen that, that there's value to be had and that i'm going to split that into the easy stuff and the hard stuff so the easy stuff we put in master and over the years we've gradually been introducing more type annotations as we go this hasn't been a primary focus of our development work at all we've just been accumulating them I really only want to use simple types, um, things like I talked about in the first half of this talk, uh, because I think it's really important that our code is understandable by other Python developers. Um, I don't want to end up with a, with a sort of complicated Haskell or Idris complicated type annotations that maybe they're theoretically correct, but they're extremely hard to understand by another arbitrary developer. Um, if anything gets complicated, then we can make use of uh, gradual typing and just say, all right, this isn't any type. We can try and describe it in the doc string. We can do other kinds of testing to, to, to check correctness. Um, but at the type level, we just say it's an any. And we um, enforce this in two ways. At API boundaries where users call into our code at runtime, we have type guards. So we know if they've crossed that boundary via type guard, the types are correct. And then within the code base at CI time, we use MyPy to check that one piece of the code, one piece of the parcel code is talking to another piece of the parcel code correctly. So that happens every time we, we, we do anything with a, a pull request. So, Without pushing on things too hard, what are the payoffs? For me, the biggest payoff has been static typing coverage for code that we aren't running our integration tests on. And, and that really um, falls into two categories. One is all of the exception and error handling paths. Those are very rarely exercised um, in our integration tests. So I've quite often found that some code to do with exception handling has rotted, a variable's been renamed, a constructor has changed, a data structure has changed, something like that. And it just hasn't been 
fixed when it when when um, another piece of the code uses it. Um, and so this sort of static typing across the whole code base really flushes out that kind of um, that kind of change, um, that kind of error. And the other kind is that we have a lot of plugins that are untested in our CI because we have um, we can run on lots of different supercomputers, and the different supercomputers have different software installed on them. Um, which we talk to, and we don't have all of that installed in our CI. So um, if we don't have it installed, we can't um, we can't test the plugin against the um, against the, against the, the supercomputer code. So the only option we have is to do some kind of static analysis. So that doesn't catch bugs, but again, it well it doesn't catch all bugs. It doesn't check that the code works, but it does mean that if we change APIs or whatever, it, it gives us um, CI failures quite often to remind us to go through and fix um, all of the plugins which are affected. The downsides are that uh, this partially annotated master code base is still full of um, the very gradual any types everywhere. So it's extremely runtime dynamic checks it's nowhere near the sort of arrogant arrogant haskeller kind of it type checks so it must be correct we are absolutely nowhere near that the hard stuff so some of the more complicated things i talked about in the second part of the talk i really don't want personally to be pushing that on our other developers at the moment it it's there's there's too much um Type theory essentially. If you're if you're the kind of person that 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 likes programming in Haskell, then some of that stuff is pretty trivial. But if you're um, a a student doing your summer project at the university, um, and you're trying to just prototype stuff um, or anything like that, I really don't want to be forcing that sort of stuff onto you. So I keep all of the hard stuff in a separate branch where it's just for my exploration um, of, of how, thing, how things might work. So very often in, in that branch, I discover bugs and I fix those bugs and I port those bugs to the master branch, but I don't necessarily port the complicated type annotations I've made over as well. Um, maybe I can make a simpler, looser type annotation. Maybe I can't. Okay. Um, on that branch, I'm free to use as complicated types as I want. I'm free to use the latest Python. So the, 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 the type annotation system in Python changes has been changing quite a lot um, with every uh, Python release. So the, the core master, we're trying to still be backwards compatible to Python 3.6, I believe at the moment. So I can't use any new type features since Python 3.6 in, in master. Um, on, this, on this exploration branch, we can say, all right, Python 3.10. Um, we can use the, the latest stuff. And as time passes, um, hopefully we'll, the, the master branch will catch up with, with that. Um, with, with, we'll drop support for 3.6, move on to 3.7 and so on over time. And we'll be able to move some of the stuff from this branch into master. And I don't have any worries about confusing other people in this branch at all. So the conclusion, the easy stuff is pretty easy. It just looks like sticking type annotations on. It's paid off immediately for us in flushing out a lot of bugs. Um, you really need to be prepared to use the gradual typing features though, because an existing code base that wasn't written to be type checked Porting that can get very hard, very fast if it's in a, in a style that is not amenable to, to, to be type checked. However, it is worth it, even with nowhere near complete coverage, in my opinion. I think if you are going to use, um, if you're going to write fresh code and you, you're writing it with the intention of it being type checked, you would write in a style that makes it checkable just in the same way that you might write code that 
you want to run unit tests against. So you write the code in a style that you could unit test against. Um, so I think you should use at least um, the first part of this talk in all of your Python code. And maybe if you're feeling crazy, you should use the second part as well. And, and plenty of other things that, that have a similar complicated feel. That is the end. Thank you for listening.